So now we'd like to turn the time over to Jerry, Jeremy Deval, who is a first year Mac student and a student Ohana leader. Uh, and he will be introducing our first speaker, Sky Minch. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, before I introduce Sky, I'd just like to say quickly from a student perspective, the BYU Marriott School and the accounting faculty this year have done an incredible job adapting to the crazy circumstances to make this year an amazing, enriching learning experience. It's been an interesting time, uh, but the faculty has done an incredible job. So thank you. Uh, it is an honor for me today to introduce Sky Mensch. Sky is an accomplished long course professional triathlete and licensed CPA. Upon graduation with her master's degree tax from BYU, into Sky worked for Ernst & Young in their Salt Lake City office for five years. After five years of full-time work, Sky decided to work part-time in accounting, enabling her to have time to train and ultimately become a professional athlete. She currently trains about 20 to 30 hours a week in swimming, biking, and running. Her hard work and dedication and determination ultimately led to her becoming the 2019 Ironman European champion and the 2019 Boulder 70.3 champion as well. Sky is currently ranked 10th in the world and the second American in the professional triathlete organization's world rankings. Sky is a member of a training squad with Australian, New Zealand, Swiss, and Dutch athletes. She and her husband, Matt, often ask themselves the question, are we living our best life? Even through injuries and accidents, Sky's optimism and determination allows her to continue to live her best life and also inspire others to live an active, healthy lifestyle as well. So I'll now turn, on, turn the time over to you, Sky. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so I think this is how, how this is going to work is I'm gonna share my screen and you guys can see the presentation. Let's get going. So thank you for the introduction. Um, sorry to, you know, take a little longer than expected. Anyway, here's my presentation. I titled it Taking the Path of Most Resistance because I'm gonna be sharing with you kind of my last five years going from um, a big four accountant working at Ernst & Young to trying to become a world-class long course professional triathlete. And it honestly, in hindsight, I look back and it really was the difficult path to choose because despite the long hours and perhaps um, difficult work of big four accounting, this was more difficult. So just want to give an introduction to myself. So uh, there was already a great introduction, so I'll go quickly. My name's Sky Monch. My last name rhymes with Monch. It's probably the most confusing thing about me is how to say my last name. Um, I was born in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada. I moved to the USA after seventh grade and I've, I've been in Utah since uh, ninth grade. Um, as mentioned, I went to BYU and earned my bachelor's and master's degree in tax accounting. Graduated in 2011 and then, you know, went straight to EY Salt Lake City and was working there. Um, I officially started chasing my professional triathlon dream in 2015. I also married Matt Monch, where I picked up my new last name, in 2015 and became a dog mom. I'm obsessed with my dog. Um, and then I, my first professional triathlon season was in 2016 and my first professional wins were in 2019. And I'm still a licensed CPA, so we actually all still have a lot in common on this, on this call. So I wanted to give a quick little tutorial on triathlon because not everyone here probably knows. Swim, swim, bike, run is the order of triathlon. And I do long course triathlon, which is different than the Olympics. A lot of people ask me, oh, are you gonna go for the Olympics? And the answer is no, because the Olympics is very, very different. Um, first of all, I do about two to four times the distance of the Olympic distance. And the major difference is in long course, I am on a time trial bike. And in the Olympics, they're on regular road bikes and they're allowed to draft and, you know, ride in packs. So that's the big difference there. 
The events that I specialize in are the half Ironman and the full Ironman distance. You can see those distances there. Um, the full Ironman is 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and a 26.2 mile run. So it's pretty far. Um, that distance takes me about nine hours, um, hopefully under, but it's, it's a full day of racing. And this was mentioned in my introduction, but as a professional, I train on average 20 to 30 hours a week. So why accounting? Um, first of all, I love numbers. I'm sure you guys can relate. Um, and I really thrived in difficult math courses throughout high school. Um, I love the idea of being a businesswoman, even just down to the attire. You know, I liked wearing, you know, skirts and heels and things, which is funny now because it seems like the business attire has, you know, gone <laughs> pretty casual to just uh, jeans and, you know, maybe a nice top. Um, I love personal money management and dealing with money in any way. And the Accounting 200 intro courses at BYU, I just love them. The Devison credits were so fun. Um, and I just felt like an, an education and career in accounting wrapped this all into one. So I, I went for it. So why triathlon then? Um, I grew up running and I knew how to swim, but I was never top level. Like I didn't run for BYU. I didn't swim for BYU. Uh, and I, I became fully addicted to the endurance running scene after running a marathon when I was 16 years old. I learned about triathlon in high school and I was instantly intrigued, but you know, the big hang up in triathlon, well, there's a couple, but it's swimming and not having a bike. You have to have a bike to do triathlon. And I was paying for all my schooling on my own and, you know, couldn't afford a bike until I did my internship at EY and I made my first real money and I was able to afford a bike after that. And that's when I got into triathlon more seriously. Here is a picture of me doing my first ever triathlon. This was the True Blue Cougar Tri in 2009. And shout out to Parker Moffitt if he's on this call. He is also a School of Accountancy alumni. Um, that's his bike I was borrowing. He really encouraged me to do a triathlon. And based on my face, you can tell that I was really enjoying myself. So truly I was, even though I look like I'm about to cry. So here's, here comes my journey from accounting to triathlon. Um, three to four years into my e ride career, I just started to feel dissatisfied and I just needed a new challenge. And I didn't know what that challenge was going to be, but I could just feel something, you know, stirring inside of me. And I knew that I loved the endurance or runner's high. And I was pretty good on the local level, which really means nothing on the global level, but it gave me confidence that I could be a good athlete. Um, and triathlon, I don't know how many of you have watched, you know, the Kona NBC special. I would watch this Kona NBC special after the world championships happen and I'd see the pros racing and I just get this feeling inside, like this burning that that could be me. I could be that good if I wanted to be. And that kind of sat with me for a while. I didn't instantly make any moves, but kind of you know, like I said, three to four years into my career, I, I just started pondering this and I knew what I really wanted to do was pursue professional triathlon, but it was a scary move to make. So I didn't, it took a while. It took some friends encouraging me, um, feeling some support. And I kind of had to have my own realization of what I needed to do in order to really make the move. Um, also a shout out to Nate Ogden. He was a friend in the accounting program and then a friend at UI. I didn't tell him I'd be putting this picture in here of us, but I knew he'd be okay with it. We both signed uh, our new agreements. He changed employers and I was signing my flexible work arrangement agreement with EY on the same day. So I got a picture of us to remember the day forever. Um, so. My first lesson learned in my journey here is that no one is going to make a bold life change for you. And that's, that's when I ultimately made the move, when I realized that this was going to be up to me if I wanted to change my life. I was gonna have to get up from my desk and go talk to my boss and ask him and tell him what I was feeling and what I thought I needed to do. 
Um, Lynn Ames was my boss at the time. Many of you may know him. He was a partner in Salt Lake City. And he was really supportive and he could tell that I wasn't as happy, you know, in my work life. And I think he thought I was a little crazy for quitting this, you know, good big four accounting job to go chase triathlon, something that I really didn't have a lot of experience in, but he was supportive. And um, I, I felt supported by the people around me. Um, but again, I could tell people thought it was a little crazy, like a good kind of crazy, but definitely a little unexpected. Um, I just kind of made the decision one day and then I told everyone what I was going to do. It was definitely against the grain, but once I made the decision and, and got moving in the direction I wanted to go, it was a really, really good feeling. So there's lesson number one. This is a quote I wanted to share. I found it probably on Pinterest or something years and years ago. If you want something you've never had, you have to do something you've never done. And I wrote that on a sticky note and sat it on my monitor at home where I would work from home the late nights during busy season. And, you know, I would just read it all the time and it would be in my face all the time. And that, that really helped me push forward as well. And even today, you know, I made that big move in 2015 to go part-time at my job and get a coach, but I'm constantly having to remind myself that, you know, if I ever get comfortable and I need to progress, then I, I have to do something that I've never done. And that's scary sometimes, but um, so crucial to moving forward and, and, and accomplishing big things. So I wanted to share with you my naive pro triathlon plan. Again, I really had no idea what being a pro triathlete was even like. Um, totally, totally naive. So my plan was, okay, I'm gonna go part-time at EY. Um, that's gonna be enough money still. I can still earn enough to pay all my bills and I'll have my health insurance and it's all gonna be okay. Um, that'll be enough time to train. Training is going to be my priority. I'm going to communicate to everyone my schedule, and I'm never going to work like a 12 or 14 hour day again. And pretty soon, I'm going to be a world class athlete winning races. Sponsors are going to be knocking down my door. I'm going to be making money, and then I can just, you know, be done with accounting altogether pretty soon, like maybe a year or so. So that was my plan. And, you know, sometimes it's good to be clueless because when you don't know what you don't know, and you just go for it. And that was certainly the case for me. So here's, here's my transition to pro triathlon. Um, I hired a local coach in 2015, quite easily qualified to race professionally. There's kind of a list of criteria that USA Triathlon has that can qualify you as a professional. My first pro race season was 2016, and I had no idea zero idea how far behind I would be in the professional field. And just as a side note, as an amateur, I won everything by a lot. So I gained a lot of confidence um, racing amateur. Uh, in 2015, I, I won everything. And so I thought I'd go into the pro field being pretty good. And I included here my first pro race result. I had to go look this up. I remembered my placement, but I couldn't remember my time. And I finished in four hours, 42 minutes and 53 seconds. This was a half Ironman in California. And the winner's time was four hours, 16 minutes and 17 seconds. So that's coming up on 30 minutes behind the winner. That is a big gap. So, you know, I, I looked at the winner's time and I remember just thinking, how is that even possible? Like, how did they even bike that fast or run that fast? And it was shocking. I was definitely shocked but it was a good rude awakening for me because I realized how much work it was going to take to be good but it was motivating for me um I I definitely took it as like okay this is the challenge that I wanted um I'd rather do this and maybe do accounting during busy season so yeah I'm up for it here is photographic evidence of my first pro race total newbie no idea and this leads me to my second lesson I've learned. Use defeat as motivation. It means there's room to improve. 
So getting destroyed at Oceanside, my first pro race, and really my entire first year racing professionally, it really made me go back and analyze myself. And I remember looking through my diet, um, my nutrition. I remember talking to my coach and, and saying, okay, like, that was brutal. I just got beat so bad. I'm not even close to winning, but like, I think I can get there. And, you know, just talking through where we need to improve, which was everywhere. And it, it was, it was good. And I still use this lesson today. And while I don't get crushed quite like I used to, I'm not getting beat by 30 minutes. I like to beat other people by 30 minutes now, but there's always defeat I have to face even today. So whether it's, you know, me not getting a sponsor that I wanted or something as simple as maybe not making the front pack of the swim or not, not just executing a race the way I wanted to, it's defeat. Um, and that defeat just means there's room to improve and I can get better. And that's how we get better, right? If, if we're not, if we're not being defeated on some level and there's no room to improve, then that probably tells me that it's time to move on to a new challenge. So I, I thrive in knowing that I'm not perfect. So I did want to touch on how accounting funded my dream. And just so, you know, you guys are getting CPE for this. I have to talk about accounting just a little bit. So it's legit. So, I got married in 2015 and that gave me a little more financial support. I knew my husband wasn't going to let me go hungry or, you know, he would, he would pay a lot of the bills, but, and then I didn't need health insurance because I could get on his insurance. So that gave me a lot of opportunity to explore other work options. I ended up quitting my flexible work arrangement at EY. Um, I think it was February, 2016 and kind of jumped into the contract working world which I really didn't know a lot about, but I've learned a lot since. Um, the reason I went straight into contract work is because I, I told myself from the beginning of my accounting or my triathlon journey that I wasn't going to dig myself or my husband into a financial hole. So, you know, I, I am still an accountant, a conservative risk averse accountant at heart. So I knew that I had to make this sustainable. Um, and working part-time and my accounting degree and background really allowed me to pay uh, for at least triathlon, the cost of triathlon. And in case, well, you guys, I know you're wondering this question because you're accountants as well, but the cost for me, um, when I was at my peak of paying for everything and doing everything to the max, which means, you know, if I needed new race wheels, I bought them. If I needed, I, I mean, I had to pay hundreds of dollars just to like check my bike for a trip um, on, on an airplane, you know, I was spending about $30,000 a year just to be a triathlete. But again, that includes flying to all these races, all the accommodations, um, my coaching, everything. And that was at the peak. It doesn't cost me that much now because I have sponsors and, you know, receive other compensation from races. But it, it was a lot to pay for. But being an accountant and having the background and this, the way I was set up, I was able to manage my risk and at least not dig myself into a hole. And I, I, I do note that training and napping has always been priority. Unless there's a tax deadline, I kind of told myself, okay, I'm allowed to work and, you know, make money and keep my skills up and keep my CPA license. But I, I didn't quit my accounting job to just kind of be a mediocre triathlete. Like I have to, be a good triathlete. So that's always kind of been my, um, my way to manage accounting and becoming a world-class athlete. Okay, I titled this slide, so how do you make money? Because whenever I meet new people, like, you know, you're sitting in church, new ward or something, and they, you're meeting new people and you say, oh yeah, I'm a triathlete, I travel the world and I race and I like they're shaking their heads at me like, oh, cool. And then the question always comes. So how do you make money? So now I can at least say I have some sponsors and I win prize money. But, you know, for the longest time, it was definitely I am also a CPA. You know, my education's in accounting and I do contract work. So 
it was, it's been an interesting experience managing the contract world and I needed extreme flexibility in order to train as much as I needed to train and recover the way I needed to and travel. Frankly, the traveling is really demanding. Um, I mean, in years other than 2020. So it, it's definitely taken some time to find the right opportunities, but they're there. And it's given me a lot of confidence in my accounting abilities, you know, experiencing all these different contract experiences. Coming from big four, I was really confident in how to do a massive partnership return, but throw me like a tiny individual return and I was nervous, I just didn't know. So it's it's been a good experience. Um, but, you know, I'm I'm grateful that I don't have to completely rely on accounting right now. Okay, so back to triathlon. Um, she's a nobody. This is what someone said to me, and I'll tell you the story. But by 2017, so I'm now, I've gone 2015, 16, and now we're at 17 being a triathlete. I wasn't winning races. I wasn't making the podium. I wasn't making money. I had no paying sponsors, and I just wasn't accomplishing what I knew I could. And for me, I, I want to be good at what I'm doing. Like it's no one likes to do something they're not good at. So I was discouraged to say the least. And I, you know, I thought to myself more than once, like, what am I even doing? Maybe, maybe I'm not as good as I thought I could be. And maybe I just don't have it. And, um, you know, other people sometimes solidified that feeling. And now I'll share my, she's a nobody story. So I was paying for services at a local well-known company. I won't name any names so we don't scar anyone's reputations, but I noticed while I was in the office that they had athletes hanging on their walls and you know they worked with athletes and obviously prided themselves in working with athletes. And I thought, oh, awesome. Like I'm a local professional athlete. And I knew I wasn't great, but I planned to be great. And I needed to build my sponsorships and my profile. So I asked the owner of the company if if he thought there was an opportunity for, you know, me to maybe work with them a little bit or whatever, receive some services as part of a sponsorship or whatever. Um, and he was like, yeah, he was so nice. Yeah, send me an email. Here's my email. So I go home, email him that night. And he forwarded, forwards the email to his marketing person and copies me on it. And I'm I'm like excited that you know, there's some encouragement here. And then I think it was like nine o'clock at night, the marketing person replies all on accident and says, just like a blunt one sentence, she's a nobody, she just wants free stuff. And I just bawled, I just cried for like two days. I was just broken, like she just crushed me. And here I am like this tough athlete and she's a nobody it just hit me to my core and part of it's because I knew yeah she was right I'm a nobody in the triathlon world like no one knows who I am I'm not winning but to me I wasn't a nobody I mean I just worked incredibly hard the last few years I made some bold moves quit my job um put everything into this triathlon dream and here I was being called a nobody um and the reality is is no one's a nobody, right? We're all somebody to someone and certainly to ourselves. So after two days or so of feeling sorry for myself and crying to my husband and telling my training partners the stories, I made myself feel better and I finally learned my lesson, which brings me to lesson number three, believe in yourself and then keep believing in yourself. Um, you know, it's enough to think, oh yeah, I can be good. But when you're trying to accomplish something great or something big and scary, no one can believe in you the way you can believe in yourself. Because, you know, we're the ones who have to live with ourselves and we're the ones who have to sleep at night with ourselves and, you know, live with all of our actions. And so we're, we're the most invested in us and the actions and everything we do in our lives. And, you know, I, I'm glad she called me a nobody because it made me realize that I really had to count on myself. I couldn't count on anyone else, even though I had great support. You know, my coach was supportive. My husband was extremely supportive. 
But ultimately it was up to me believing in myself. And if I really wanted to become the athlete that I thought I could become, this is what it's going to be, take. It's going to be hard. No one's going to care about me <laughs> the way I want them to, but um, sticking to my belief was key to being successful. So here comes a change of events. This is a picture of my friend, Sarah. She's from Australia. Um, so I bring back my quote, if you want something you've never had, you have to do something you've never done, unless it involves Vegemite. I don't know if anyone on this call has been in Australia or had Vegemite, but it's disgusting. It's just like salt paste, basically. But she came here to train in Park City in 2016, and um, her coach reached out to my coach, and we did some training together, and ultimately resulted in me trying Vegemite for the first time. Unfortunately, not the last time. I've given it one more shot, but I'm done now. There's no more tries. But the reason I brought this picture and little story in is that things changed for me in 2017 after kind of hitting, I guess we could call rock bottom, where I knew I, I wasn't really good or being the athlete I wanted to be. So I kind of, a whole new world opened up. My friend Sarah, who was in that picture I just showed you, after the 2017 season, where she had an unreal season, she won two regional championships, she was third at Kona, just an incredible athlete. Um, you know, I was kind of expressing my disappointment and she said, you know, you should just come train, come to Australia for the winter. Like come do a training camp with me and my squad. I think your coach would be fine with it. Um, it. It could be really fun. Just mix it up, try something new. So I spoke to my coach here in Salt Lake and said, I, I wanna go to Brisbane for the summer or their summer, our winter. And he said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. That's great. So in January, 2018, I got on a plane, packed my bags for eight weeks and went to Brisbane. And my first, you know, big international flight. And I loved it immediately. I loved it. First of all, it was warm <laughs> and it was winter at home and warm is an understatement. I would say very hot and humid, but I loved it. I loved, um, doing training with the squad. I love the Australian accent, the, the way of life, um, the different terminology. It was just all a really good experience for me. But most importantly, I loved how hard they trained. I got to do a lot of the sessions that they did. Um, I coordinated with Sarah's coach and my coach on what I would do. And by the end of the trip, I knew my next big change. And that was, I needed to change coaches. Um, Cam is was and is Sarah's coach and I wanted him to coach me and Cam's based in Brisbane um, he's obviously traveled the world himself as as an athlete and then working in sport um, so before I left I was so nervous I asked him if he would coach me and he said yeah I'll, I'll coach you I think I can make you better and um, he he said as long as I would agree to travel for training camps to come see him in Australia and then you know, he would be traveling to Switzerland again in the summer. And I was like, yeah, great. Anything like, I just, I just want to get better. Um, and, and Cam knew how he could make me better. I remember standing on the pool deck one time and I asked him, I said, Cam, do you think I can be good at Ironman? Like, do you think I could win a race? And he's like, e totally, like hundred percent explain to me why I should be winning races. Explain to me how I could be great. And I mean, I was sold. So I, I left home that March, knowing that I was coming home to change coaches. Um, here's a picture of me in St. Moritz, Switzerland. Uh, the last two summers, excluding 2020, I've spent the summer in St. Moritz, Switzerland. And I raced there and then I, I've raced in Germany. And, you know, obviously just, I've just opened up my whole world doing this triathlon thing. So that's, that's one cool thing that's come from all this. There's so much travel that I've done that I wouldn't have done, you know, if I just kind of, first of all, stayed in the accounting profession. And second of all, if I hadn't changed coaches, because um, my coach, Cam, we, we run a pretty international racing schedule. And I think in my introduction, it was mentioned how international my squad is as well. Um, I have a lot of European 
friends and uh, training partners, and then obviously Australian and New Zealand. So there's that. So we're getting to where my triathlon <laughs> career is actually getting exciting. So I started with Cam officially in March of 2018. And that year I was on three podiums and I went under nine hours in the Ironman distance for the first time. And 2018 really validated my decision to race pro and keep at it. Like I finally was getting some results and I was finally starting to perform where I always knew I could. Um, and I'm so grateful for, you know, everything up until that point, but this, this was just a whole new world. Um, in 2019, I was the Dark Horse Ironman European champion, which is the second biggest race to Kona. So that was a really big deal for me to win that. Um, that was huge for me. And then my next race was Boulder 70.3. I flew home after Frankfurt and then I raced a month later and won that as well. So I ticked off my first wins. So 2019 was just an unreal year for me. I qualified for Kona um, and I was, if I didn't win the race, I was almost always second except once. Um, and 2019, I was like, okay, I can make a career out of this. Like things were going the right direction. And since we're all accountants, 2019 was the first year I made more money as a triathlete than I did as an accountant in that year, just because I had raced so well. Um, and, you know, I get paid for performing at races because the prize money and things. So 2019 was, was a very good year. Um, here's me winning Frankfurt. That's the finishing tape. So much fun. Um, and that leads to my fourth lesson. I realized that it takes a team to be successful, but it must be the right team. And I'm so grateful for my first coach. You know, I needed my first coach as much as I need my current coach. But there comes a point where you may need to change your team to really get where you want to go. And, and this is something I constantly have to remind myself of. Even down to me, down to like, who's, who's my massage therapist? Um, those little things, like if, if I'm not getting what I need out of the team that's supporting me and helping me accomplish these athletic endeavors, um, I need to make a change. And, and that's difficult too sometimes, right? Like we can't, it, it gets personal, we have relationships with people, but um, sometimes the if the team's not right, then the, you know, things aren't going in the right direction. And I think especially, you know, the smaller the team, I mean, I'm not a 50 person team here. It's me, it's my coach, it's my husband, it's my massage therapist, it's my chiropractor, whatever, you know, the smaller the team, it's like the more impactful the team members are and and they have to just be right and we all have to have the same vision we all have to be working in the same direction to really be successful so a big lesson there and one that i i constantly evaluate so i decided to really end 2019 with a bang um september 24th i was just a couple weeks out from competing at my first ironman world championship I had a devastating bike crash. I was coming down Mill Creek Canyon in Salt Lake City, which is right next to my home. And I crashed. I, I don't know exactly what happened. I was being careful. I've descended hundreds and hundreds of times down mountains in these canyons. And it was just the worst timing. And this, this kind man found me. He assessed my situation and took me to the ER. And the reason I called this slide, Is This Real Life, is because he said on the the drive down the canyon, I asked him about 50 times if this was real life. Um, I was completely out of it. I don't even remember being with him, but apparently I really, really didn't want this to be real life. So here's a picture of me in the hospital bed. And I actually just copied and pasted um, the end of my Instagram post sharing my crash. And I said, my body is bruised and broken. I had a concussion. I had bleeding outside the brain. My right elbow was shattered. My right collarbone was broken and my left thumb was busted. Um, my bike is a bit broken and my heart is a bit broken, but my spirit and determination are not broken. Thank you to everyone for the love I've received. I get surgery next week to repair some of my injuries and I will keep you posted. So this was my first bike crash, 10 years of riding a bike in these mountains in Utah and um, never, never crashed. And then two weeks before the biggest race of my life, I end up in the hospital completely unable to even do anything for myself. Um, it was a 
tough recovery, but I was so motivated to get through it because I wanted to race again. I wanted so badly to be at the top level. Um, man, it was hard watching Kona and knowing where I would have been if the day had gone well. And I was, I was really on track. I, I recovered so hard. I was at physical therapy twice a week. I was doing everything possible. Um, it was quite painful, but I, I knew I wanted to be back racing at my best in April of 2020. But as we all know, 2020 took quite the turn. So I was planning to race Oceanside 70.3 at the beginning of April and about mid-March is when that got postponed. So, you know, I thought, okay, well, you know, my first couple of races maybe aren't going to happen, but that's okay. Like, I'm going to keep this up. I'm going to keep getting fit. My arms and everything's only getting stronger from my crash. Um, and I kept up the training, but then everything just kept getting canceled and postponed. And I mean, this isn't news to anyone. We all know what this year has been like. But the, the biggest struggle for me is I felt extremely unproductive as an athlete. You know, despite training around 20 hours a week, um, I wasn't progressing. I, you know, it's hard to see progress as an athlete if you're not racing. So that was really difficult. And um, I tried to take on more accounting work. Some things worked out, some things didn't. But finally, an opportunity came and I worked with a firm VP tax. Um, and I did the, I worked the October 15th deadline and doing corporations. And wow, I felt amazing. Like I've never been so excited to work a tax deadline because I felt I, I was just thriving again. I was learning all about the new tax laws um, and actually putting it into practice. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful that I've kept up my accounting because of that. So the rest of the year, how it's played out so far, I, I would finally get an opportunity to race locally in September at the Bear Lake Brawl. Um, and that was fun. And then it looked like Ironman Florida was going to happen because Florida is pretty liberal with their um, COVID requirements. So my coach and I decided at the end of December, uh, at the end of September that we were going to start training as if Ironman Florida was going to happen on November 7th. So I just got slammed with training, just completely full into Ironman training, which is really intense, like back to back 30 hour training weeks. Um, and I was able to race Ironman Florida, just, I guess it's just under two weeks ago now. And I placed second in a time of 8.46.35. And I ran my best marathon by 10 minutes, um, which was probably the most exciting part of the race for me is running as the fastest I ever have. Um, prior to Florida, I, I kind of consistently ran around a 3.14 marathon off the bike. And I ran a 3.03 something at Florida. So that was a big jump for me. And up next for me, I have a race in Daytona in a couple weeks. Um, that's a championship level race. It's in the Daytona Speedway, uh, NASCAR Speedway, and kind of a closed, controlled environment. And, you know, athletes are actually coming from all over the world. They've been able to get travel exemptions as professional athletes. So I'm super excited to be part of that. Um, and... Oh, here's me at Ironman Florida just a couple of weeks ago. I think that was right at the end of the marathon, um, which is always the best part, the most painful, but also exciting. Which leads me to my fifth lesson, and this is my final lesson. Um, in 2020, I realized that constant self-evaluation is required if we want to get the best out of ourselves. And this one wasn't even necessarily related to triathlon. You know, I spent I was kind of in a funk for the middle of the year where I just didn't feel like I was accomplishing anything. And finally, I, I kind of pulled myself out of it and, you know, thought, what can I do to get the best out of myself right now? Like, maybe I can't race, but what can I do? And, you know, I like worked with my husband and remodeled our basement. I, I took on the work for the October 15th deadline and then I was able to race. And after racing, I realized all the things that I need to do to improve as an athlete. Um, not having the opportunity to race for so long, it's hard to really analyze yourself and think, oh, what did I not do well in that race? What do I need to work on in training? What, what are the things that I can gain that, you know, next 1% thing to get better? And one thing I always think to myself in training and otherwise, and certainly can be applied to non-triathlon is, you know, sometimes we think we're trying hard, but we could be trying harder. 
So I ask myself that all the time, like, how could I be trying harder? Um, because I always want to get the best out of myself. And even when circumstances are not in our favor, as most of us probably find this year has brought, um, if we're really doing that honest self-evaluation, I believe we can get the best out of ourselves. So those are my lessons. And I hope, I hope that everyone had something maybe, um, you know, you can identify with one of these lessons or maybe something like struck a chord with you of how you can improve your life and how you can maybe be a better uh, husband, wife, or um, employer or employee, whatever it is, or maybe if there's some changes in your life that you've been wanting to make, but have been hesitant to make them because it's scary. I hope, I hope to inspire everyone on this call to do something, um, something big and scary or something that seems hard because it's so satisfying um, to work hard at something. And even if, even if it's failure at first, um, if, if you believe you can be great at something, then I believe you can be great at something as well. So um, that's the end of my presentation. And I thought I'd leave a few minutes for questions uh, if, if anyone has any questions related to anything, really. I'm an open book. Um, this is so funny doing a presentation to a screen because I have no idea if, you guys are even awake still, but I hope you are. So let's let's open it for questions. Okay, Sky. So I have my assistant. She's been gathering questions from the chat, and she'll ask okay. you the questions. Okay. Okay. Hi, Sky. Thank you so much. That was really inspiring. Um, first off, we've got James Sloan who asked, "How has COVID impacted your ability to be sponsored and maintain any sort of income related to your new and fun profession?" That's a really good question. So sponsorship has been a really interesting thing this year. Um, for me personally, I haven't been aggressive in trying to get new sponsors um, personally, just because uh, having not raced most of the year, and then I, I know a lot of companies are struggling financially just even without sponsoring. Um, I've, I've maintained my sponsors. The sponsors that I do have have been very loyal and they've you know, they've delivered on their contracts and payments with me. So that's been good. Um, I also received an annual bonus earlier this year. Um, newly developed is the Professional Triathletes Organization. It's backed by Mike Moritz. He is a billionaire run. I think he started Sequoia Capital. You guys may be familiar with him. And he is backing the Professional Triathletes Organization. And they part of the structure is that they have an annual bonus and the professional triathletes organization at the beginning of this year decided to pay out the bonus based on ranking and I'm ranked 10th in the world so I got a pretty good bonus um, which kind of helped relieve financial stress of this year um, and on the on the other side of that even though I haven't been able to race a lot and win a lot of prize money or bonuses and things I'm not spending as much money. Like I'm not flying to Europe. I'm not paying for two months of accommodation in St. Moritz, Switzerland, which is like expensive. So costs are down. Income is a bit down, but um, costs are down, so. Next question. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, our next question is from Morgan Clark who is wondering how big your international squad is and if you all have the same coach. Yeah, we all have the same coach. Our squad is called the Hills District. Um, the size, I think it varies throughout the year. And um, most of the squad members, the majority are Australian because that's where my coach is. That's his home base. Even though, you know, he'll go to Switzerland, he'll even come here to Park City. Um, but I would say he keeps around 15 to 20 athletes, depending, and obviously athletes come and go. But yeah, 15 to 20. I know right now he has uh, two Dutch athletes, a um, couple New Zealand athletes, and he just took on another American. So now there's two American pros that he's coaching. So, and then the rest are Australian. That sounds exciting and fun to be involved with so many people from all over the world. It is. <laughs> yeah, I actually have one of my squad mates staying with me right now. She, she's here from Australia for the race in Daytona. So it's fun. That sounds really fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Matt Patton asked a question. He asked, uh, he said, I'm amazed at how quickly you improved when you changed coaches. What were some of the major specific changes your new coach encouraged you to make? And then Julie asked yep. for some advice for people who are looking to up their game for physical activity. Yeah, okay, so the first question on coaching, um, you know, physical adaptations do take time. So I fully respect that, you know, I had been working at it a few years and things had adapted and changed. Um, and so there's, you know, credit to my first coach, but my second coach is just, um, he knows what it takes to get athletes to the next level, to the world-class elite level. And the training was just a lot harder, a lot more specific, a lot more intense. Um, it's just very applicable to me doing a race as fast as possible. So honestly, it was the training and then just, it gave me confidence as well. You know, I kind of, I kind of ran out of confidence with my other coach. Like I just was like, this isn't working. So getting a new start and knowing that I was with a coach who really knew what he was doing and that he could make me better. Like if he couldn't make me better then no one could. And I was just going to go back to accounting. So, um, that made a difference for me, the mental aspect, I think. And then tips for people wanting to up their game um, with being physically active, you know, I would say take it slow. Um, I think a lot of people, even my husband does this, he'll like try to just go out and run as fast as he can for like a mile, which a mile's not that far for me. But, you know, if you don't run at all, a mile's quite significant. So I think um, taking it slow, if you want to get into running, it's like do like two minutes of easy jog, one minute walk, two minutes easy jog, one minute walk. And then also just finding something that you actually like. Um, you don't have to be into Peloton riding a bike inside. You don't have to be into running. You know, there's those are maybe the easy things and popular things, but there's so many ways to stay active and finding something that you like is important. But yeah, you also have to give it time. Like, exercising hurts if you're not fit and you know we can all say oh, i'll give it a couple of weeks but i say give it like three months and then it and then it'll start to feel good and then you might be addicted like i am so well maybe if i work out more often i'll i'll get addicted yeah <laughs> thank you so much sky i think yeah. we have time for one more really quick question okay um and i've seen a lot of questions from guests who are curious about your long-term plans and how long you think mm. you'll be able to compete and whether or not you want to yeah. coach or go back to accounting full-time. Tell yeah. us about it. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't have a set in stone plan. I mean, obviously there's a few things in my future that I know I will want to do. Um, in terms of how long I think I can compete well, um, I mean, there are women who have had children and are now 40 to 42 and they're still competing really, really well. I mean, the woman who was third behind me at Ironman Florida two weeks ago, she's 42 and has a child. Um, uh, so I don't feel like there's necessarily an end date on what my um, athletic career is, but I'm not saying I'm gonna go that long. I'm 32 right now. So that's like potentially another 10 years. And I will tell you the training and travel it's quite exhausting. Like it's so demanding. I have to say no to so much. Like there's so much that I miss out on. I mean, it's, it's an exchange for, right? Like I love my triathlon experience, but there's so much that I don't do. I, I tell friends no all the time. I don't go to, there's so many things I just don't do because I'm training and sleeping and traveling. Um, so my long-term plan is to do this until I feel like I'm ready to move on to the next thing. And then I also know that I want to have a couple kids someday. So I'm 32 and in my head, I'm like, okay, I, maybe like when I'm 35, I should start to think about having a couple children. Um, but I, I do feel like depending on how the next few years go, you know, if you, if you perform at the really, a really high level and you have good sponsorship and support, then if you have a child and want to come back, I think it's easier to come back, right? Like you have income and you have support. Um, so. A lot of it just depends on how the next few years go. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly plan to be full on with triathlon for another few years. And then in terms of accounting, I mean, I keep up my CPA license because I want to keep my options open. Um, I don't want to go back to full-time public accounting. I, that's not what I'm interested in really. I've enjoyed the part-time part, but 
I think I would really enjoy teaching. I was a TA at BYU for two or three years and I really enjoyed that. So I think teaching and, you know, just being involved with more people, some kind of role where I'm more involved with people and um, maybe helping others accomplish their goals is what I would be interested in. But yeah, no, no set in stone plan for me. Well, Sky, I just want to say, and, and from the, I know you can't look at the chat and talk at the same time, but everybody okay. loved you and has some oh, great you. questions. And I wish um, that we could have answered all of those questions. However, we have been um, recording all of the questions and all of the compliments, and we'll send those to you. And okay. You can fill in some of those questions, and we can attach that to our recap um, email that we'll be sending out to the